Welcome everyone. This session is called Resume One, Building Your Comprehensive Resume. My name is Alex Johnston and I'm the director of the master's program in language and communication in the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown University, where I teach intercultural communication and career management for linguists. And the session today should give you an idea of how to build what I call a comprehensive resume, which is going to be your basis for all the other resumes that you will tailor to specific job applications throughout your career. This is a tool that you can use in order to be more successful in developing resumes that will be a better fit with the jobs that you choose to apply to. Let's go. So our agenda for today is to talk about those genre differences, CVs and resumes, what are they? <laughs> And then I'll talk about the difference between a comprehensive resume and a tailored resume. A really important part of today is starting to reframe your experience. I want to give you hope. You have more than you think. And so to do that, we're going to do an exercise that's called All the Jobs I've Ever Had. And we'll get to that later. This will be a necessary first step towards building that comprehensive resume. So the work that you'll do in this workshop today is geared towards developing that comprehensive resume, which is going to be all of the experience that you've had in order to remind yourself that you have more than you think and you've accomplished more than you thought. Getting right to it, first I want to talk about what's an academic CV and I'm gonna focus on what that means in the US context. But I do want to explore how other, how that might be used differently in other places around the world. And I'll rely on some of our attendees to join into that discussion. An academic CV is everything you've ever accomplished in academia. And that usually includes these buckets below, broadly speaking. It's a list of your research, teaching, service, and here we, we mean administration, it means being on committees, it means serving on, on projects and, and, law, and committees for your department, for the university, and for the field. It also includes your grants and awards and, and other accomplishments. But in general, these are the buckets. There are many different sub types of these of teaching, for example, it can be uh, teaching that you've done at your university it can be visiting at other universities. It can be invited talks and ad hoc talks if you can put a lot into your academic CV. It generally remains the same. It just grows over time. The longer you're in academia, the more you keep adding to it. Typically, the most recent accomplishments get added in reverse chronological order. So since you just keep adding to it over time, it can be over 50 pages. It just gets longer with time and experience in academia. So it's not unusual to see someone who is a full professor who's been in academia for decades to have 50, 60, 70, 100 pages of a, an academic CV. So what's a resume then? I don't know how to update my resume and at this point I'm too afraid to ask. I'm sure a lot of you might feel this way. I put this in here just to say that if you don't know the differences between CVs and resumes, even if you feel like at this stage in my life, at the age that I am, where I am, I should know that, please don't think about that anymore. This is something that you don't know unless you are explicitly taught it, <laughs> unless you have a lot of experience talking about this genre and if you've taken other training sessions. So please don't feel like questions today will be uh, perceived as you know something you should have known a long time ago. No, you can gather information about these genres throughout your life and please don't feel afraid to, to ask any kind of questions about it or feel like this is something I should have known, but I welcome all questions. The same goes for any other 
tool that we present during this, this month of programming. Um, in the session the other day, we were talking about your LinkedIn profile and how important LinkedIn is for networking. And there was a comment on our feedback that I'm embarrassed to say I don't have a LinkedIn profile and I don't know where to start with it. Oh, that's not a problem. Don't even worry about that. That kind of knowledge, again, is not a given. And this is the place to really explore that. So this is one way that we can actually develop these informal and ad hoc groups as we go through the month. We can get together and have a LinkedIn workshop and a LinkedIn makeover. And we can start from the very beginning and talk about everything you need to put in your LinkedIn. That's what we're gonna do with resumes too. All questions are on the table. So what really is it? Typically, and I just say typically, it's a one to two page document. Every bullet point starts with an action verb. So there's no use of I. I've seen some initial resumes where people write them in terms of, I was an assistant to in the legislative office to Congress person, Ted Liu. We wanna start that type of a bullet point with an action verb and eliminate the use of I. It's a, it's a given. And we'll talk about how to do that later. The bullets that you use in a resume should show some type of quanti quantified results. And again, we'll talk about it. The resume is showing results, results that you've accomplished. And you wanna make it an easy to read format, highlighting your experience and your accomplishments. And I'll, I'll differentiate among types of resumes that you might be asked to submit. But basically the resume is a chance to shine and to showcase your experience, your accomplishments. It's a list of what you've done. Now, as far as formatting, and this is something we'll talk about, there are times when you have a display resume and this is when it comes to a hard copy that you might actually present to somebody, which, which still, still happens in in-person mixers and networking events or in an in-person interview. You may present a PDF of a beautifully formatted resume that you can submit in an online application. Those are resumes that you can really work on the formatting on and make it look beautiful. Um, Beautiful meaning, in this sense, clean, easy to read, a lot of white space. Sometimes, though, you're going to be asked to forget your beautifully formatted, clean, clear resume and enter manually all of your accomplishments into some type of digital form where you'll be asked questions in the form and you are forced to put different sections of your resume into different text boxes. And for those your formatting gets stripped away and it's the content of those bullet points that you wanna focus on. So when we talk about building a comprehensive resume, we're not gonna to worry too much about the look of it. We're gonna focus on the content and how you write your bullet points and what experience you choose to frame into those bullet points. And resumes are typically in reverse chronological order there are other types of resumes. So some people in certain situations use skills-based resumes where they talk about communication skills and list experiences and results that showcase their communication skills. This might be appropriate for a job that is for a communications manager. For example, most typically you would find a reverse chronological order resume, but we can discuss when it might be appropriate to, to change that type of format. And again, when I'm presenting these kinds of general guidelines, take them as general. They will always be dependent on the industry and the type of job that you're applying to. So that's why we focus on tailoring later on. Now, when an employer asks for a CV, I'd like you to ask yourself and do some research. Where is this employer or organization based? Where is that position based? And is it a research position or is it somehow academia adjacent? Because sometimes employers in the US may ask for a CV, 
when they actually need a resume. And the term CV abroad in certain areas can refer to what I'm describing as a resume. So I actually wanted to uh, call out Alfonso, uh, if you don't mind. And right now I, I can't see most of you, but Alfonso, if you care to unmute, since you have been in the, the UK context, how do employers refer to CVs and resumes in the UK context, just really briefly? Um, well, but mostly it's not that, you know, like um, my experience with that was actually as a uh, postgraduate student, but I was kind of exposed to, um, you know, different contexts. And it's true that as Charlotte is saying, it's just mostly CV in general. So my understanding was the resume was mostly the American English word for that. But from what I'm learning, that there is a slight difference, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about. So yeah, mostly CV is the word that I would just normally uh, be familiar with. Yeah. So I I asked you, you know, thanks for thanks for joining the conversation this way and allowing me to call you out. You do want to be careful that you are operating under the same assumptions as the person who is asking you for that CV or resume. So typically in the US context, if somebody talks about a CV, it's going to be that academic CV, that really mm -hmm. long document that is for an academic position or academic adjacent position. For example, as a researcher um, in, a, in an organization, you know, maybe an ed tech organization even, most of the time you're going to be creating a resume and that will follow the guidelines that I just went over. It's short, it has bullet points that focus on accomplishments. Most of all, it is an edited narrative that is tailored to that particular position. So that is going to be changeable. This is one of the big takeaways here that I hope you, you take forward in your working life is that Resumes are flexible, changeable, malleable documents. And you'll use a slightly different resume for every position that you apply to. Slightly different. Because in each one, you may want to present yourself as a slightly different person, focusing on specific skills and specific experiences that are germane to that position. OK? So yes. That is why I recommend creating this comprehensive resume from which you can carefully edit and curate all of those tailored resumes to come. What's the purpose of a resume? Would anybody like to unmute and tell me what's the purpose of a resume as I've described it? Yeah, Min. Um, to highlight your experience and accomplishment, but like targeted, more targeted to the job. Yes, good. Okay. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Robin, I see your hand up. I would say the purpose of the resume is to get them to invite you to an interview. Boom and boom. Both of you nailed it. Bravo. Absolutely. The purpose of a resume first and foremost is to get you that interview. The resume is not gonna be what gets you the job. You wanna be able to get an interview. You wanna be able to get to the next interactional stage in the hiring process. Submitting your resume and your application package is just the first step. After, what comes after will be an interview, sometimes it'll be a screener with an HR representative. It may then include an interview with a hiring manager. It may then include an interview with a team that you might be working with who might run through interview questions, could also give you a task to accomplish with that within that interview. The range of hiring procedures and the length of time and the types of interactions that occur along that hiring pathway are diverse, but that first step is the, inter is the resume that will lead to the interview. 
So that's why the, the resume is so important for, as Min says, to showcase your results and accomplishments. Because by doing that, you are showing an employer that you can get things done, that you have experience accomplishing things that will solve problems for their organization, because you will have selected the accomplishments that are related to what you might be doing with that organization based on their job announcement that lists what you'll need to do. So accomplishments. This professional cat says, if you look into my resume, you'll notice I have caught the red dot. So your resume is going to be this list of, you know, red dots caught. What it's not going to be is a list of job responsibilities. It's not going to list what you've done in the past in terms of responsibilities. So in the case of this cat writing their resume, tasked with catching red dots for whatever position that was, role of house cat tasked with catching red dots. I've seen many resumes that list this type of task or responsibility. That doesn't tell me anything as someone who's hiring. A better cat resume accomplishment bullet, believe me, this will apply to you, just let's generalize from the cat, is to write this as, caught 10 red dots per week. This is better, this is better. There's a quantification here, there's a time period, and it actually is an accomplishment, it's not a task. This is what the cat did. Good job, caught 10 red dots per week. I can generalize as a hiring manager and say, wow, they can catch red dots for me. I like that. That's what they'll need to do here. They've done it before and they've quantified it. Even better, developed dot catching process, adopted company wide, resulting in 75% quarter three increase. How about that? That's an even better cat accomplishment. <laughs> the cat has shown they can develop a process that can be implemented across a company used by others and has had a quantifiable result that helped the company. Now we're talking. This is what we're going to be working towards in a lot of the bullet points that you'll be writing. And maybe some of this language is a little different. It may be, it may be quite different. You may be a little concerned here. You know, that sounds like resume ease. And yeah, I get it. On Twitter, this person asked, how would you write I changed a light bulb on your resume? And here's what here's the response. Single-handedly manage the successful upgrade and deployment of new environmental illumination system with zero cost overruns and zero safety incidents. Yeah, that definitely is resume ease, doesn't it? And and for some, I, I don't want to, you know, presume, but it may sound uh, may sound empty. It, it may sound wordy. We want to make sure that the accomplishments you present are authentic and they they do represent um, actual accomplishments. That they're they're verifiable. They're not misleading. That there's there's nothing that could be conceived as as overinflating accomplishments, right? So we'll keep this in the back of our mind and discuss this type of language later. Put this on hold. We'll get to bullet point language later. But really, the purpose today is to get started of thinking, get started thinking about what become what comes before the bullet points. That's where you need to invest some time and some thought. So I recommend doing a self audit to make sure you're not missing useful experiences in your past that you can draw from for your resume. I want you to start to reframe your experiences so that you can tack it on to this larger document of a comprehensive resume, which should be a file sitting in your computer somewhere. And from that, you can curate the experiences that you will put on individual tailored resumes. 
we want to do that because we tend to overlook a lot from our own experiences. There are things that we've done that seem so normal to us, so naturalized to us as simply part of the academic experiences that we've had, simply part of being a student, being a TA, being a professor. We tend not to frame certain types of experiences as, as worthy or as useful to apply to a professional resume, to a job outside of academia. For example, teachers, faculty, TAs, any student who creates presentations on a regular basis, slideshows, anyone who creates presentations and translates their academic work into language that other people can understand, that a general audience can relate to, is doing a type of is accomplishing something that's useful and applicable in the business world. Because usually this is creating presentations, talking to audiences that we do every day in academia is useful in the business context, especially when we can uh, show that we can create those presentations and deliver them on short notice on while juggling multiple timelines. These normalized experiences from academia we think of as just part of grad school, just part of being a student or part of being a volunteer. Volunteering for a nonprofit organization and managing the customer database is something that's applicable in, outside and in the business world, even if it hasn't been a paid position or a long-term position. Your dissertation if you are in a PhD program or any longer term research project, even a term project for one of your courses in undergraduate or graduate school can be framed as a research project that has delivered results that have application. I'll have examples of that later. Getting more into what is experience, I want to emphasize that it includes aspects of your academic training. So this is something that was talked about in Kelsey's session yesterday in the, in the human language technology job overview. Someone in the, the feedback form said, I'm thrilled to know my academic training counts. Now we have to talk about how it counts, but your time working and learning and training in linguistics, that's useful experience. Learning about how language works, how communication works, and picking up valuable skills about how to analyze, how to pattern recognize, and how to think about systems that you can use as valuable experience and talk about uh, on your resume and in job interviews. Experience doesn't have to be paid. So many of you have done volunteer work. Volunteer work can be experience, absolutely. I spent many years as a as the president of the chapter board of the Fulbright Association, a statewide uh, chapter in the state of Iowa. Several years doing that as a volunteer, working with the board and managing events in the state of Iowa for the Fulbright Association in service of the Fulbright program. That was unpaid experience that I did for years out of, out of love and in my spare time that eventually I was able to leverage into a position on staff full at the Fulbright Association. These types of volunteer experiences are very useful to talk about on a resume in terms of accomplishments. We'll have examples later. Again- hey, Alex, we have a question in the chat. Yeah. Thanks. So first question, what is a possible way to translate regular academic presentation creation as a useful skill in a resume? Created four to five multimedia presentations per week for over the course of X months, translated academic research 
to general audiences to there are, there are a lot of ways to talk about your your skills as a ta and your ways of presenting information to audiences to show that you know how to talk to diverse people in a way that they can understand to translate research into a way they can understand through a multimedia presentation that's something that in the the corporate environments that i've been a part of have has been really valued uh, by those organizations. That's one way to start phrasing that. And I'll present some some others in the as we as we go forward. I'm just keeping an eye on time because I do want to make sure that we get a break. I'm going to stop before I exercise. So let me finish this, and then I'll stop sharing so that we can all see each other, so that I can see you. Your experience doesn't have to be full time. And experience doesn't have to have been titled or assigned by an organization. It doesn't even have to be with an organization. And I say this because very often there are things, there are projects that we take on on our own outside of an organization or with a small team, a small group of people that we're working with. And, and that is experience. If you decide that you want to build a website to showcase your work, maybe you work on, on different types of data organization um, and you build a website and use it to present your portfolio of, of projects that you've done in your spare time, that's really useful to leverage. The fact that we're all here at the LCL, this is experience we can leverage as well. Somebody asked in a feedback form or in Slack, is this something we can put on a resume, this LCL experience? Yeah, yeah, and let's talk about why and how. We're gonna actually, <laughs> we were thinking this morning of sending you out a bullet point that you could use to put on your resume about how to frame this type of experience. So, I do want to get to our exercise, but I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can debrief for a bit and then take a break. And thank you for that question in the chat. Do you recommend using re websites that create re resumes for us through filling in some info boxes? If so, which ones? And thanks for the recommendation that, that came through for Canva. You can do that for sure. LinkedIn is one way to do that automatically. So if you fill out a really extensive LinkedIn profile, you're able to export that LinkedIn profile as a resume and also send it directly to recruiters. So that's another advantage of filling out your LinkedIn profile. And for those of you who are not familiar with LinkedIn, again, none of us expect you to, to know uh, the ins and outs of LinkedIn and, and how it evolves and continues to evolve, but it can be used for so many purposes. And that's one, one purpose is that you can export that as a PDF. How to list things like a one to two week course, like a web scraping course using R. I don't consider myself an expert in R, but I did do the course and want to list it. This is absolutely something that I recommend you putting on your comprehensive resume, which we're going to start building. List things like these. And yes, you can write what that course was about, what you achieved through that course. You probably worked on a project in that course um, as, as one outcome. So talk about that project and what the result was and how it could be applied. Write that in a bullet point for your comprehensive resume. A course or you know, experience doesn't have to be a semester long course. These one week, two week, four week boot camps that you might be involved in, those can be very useful accomplishments to, to list on a comprehensive resume. Just because it's listed there doesn't mean that you will include that in every tailored resume that you send out for every job. Because again, we want to make sure that we're shaping every tailored resume specifically to that job announcement. 
and that organization. So there may be organizations and job positions where putting in the two week course on R may not be relevant. For example, if you're applying to a communication manager position at a nonprofit company, it may not be relevant. You may want to focus instead on a communication boot camp like the LCL. <laughs> That's a lot of communication focus, right? Or focus on other accomplishments that highlight your skills in communication. Can I ask a question? Please. I am just, as you're speaking, I'm, I could keep on coming back to the theme of is less more or is more just more? Because for example, in my resume, I've often eliminated things because I feel personally like it makes me look like I'm all over the place and I'm not focused. So um, I, maybe you will get to this, like, do you then narrow, take out the things that would not be appropriate in terms of what you're applying for? Or I mean, is more really better? More is better for your comprehensive resume because I don't want you to forget any of those experiences that you've had that you may see make you, make you appear all over the map. That's fine for your comprehensive resume. What I'm suggesting that you do is to create this document, label it comprehensive resume, Katie's comprehensive resume, and you, you put in everything so that you don't forget it because so easily we forget what we've done. It happens even over the course of a year. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be something that you did uh, five years ago, 10 years ago. Put in everything, put in accomplishments, awards, um, money. Homeschooling your children through the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh my God. Yeah, you and me both. Um, you want to put in things that you can draw from for, for both your resume and down the line job interviews. The second part of your of your point is yes, when you're applying to a specific job, you do narrow down, you do curate because your comprehensive is likely going to be several pages. It could be just depending on on what you draw from and what you put in there. But the comp, the tailored resume that you're going to do for every specific job interview is going to be geared toward that specific job it's going to be a curated narrative that's going to position you as a good fit for that position based on the responsibilities and the qualifications that are listed there. But again, remember the point that we've been making throughout here, which I hope you've heard in um, Kelsey's presentation yesterday and perhaps earlier in the week. Job announcements that list qualifications and list um, you know, desired and recommended and necessary experience. Those are mostly wish lists that are written by a hiring manager, written by somebody on the team. They're throwing that out like a fishing net and seeing what they collect. This does depend on the sector. So if you're applying for a federal job, there are certain necessary qualifications that you have to have or else you can't apply at all. But in general, desired qualifications, those are things that you can write towards for every tailored resume. And you don't have to fulfill every single one of them. Paulina, yes, volunteering is absolutely a type of experience. You know, like I mentioned, volunteering as a nonprofit leader for me led to a position on staff with a nationwide nonprofit. That is very valuable experience to show. It doesn't have to be paid, it doesn't have to be full time. It needs to show the skills that you've developed over that volunteer work. Absolutely. I'm going to address some of the questions in the chat during our exercise. 
for now, I want to let you know that we're going to actually, first of all, Wendy asked, is office hours an appropriate place for somebody to look over a comprehensive or a tailored resume? Yes, absolutely. That is what office hours are for. So, and we would love to do that with you. Just let us know, let anybody know, uh, all, any of the career linguists know that you are presenting them with a comprehensive resume or a resume that was for a specific job. Because what they'll have in mind is this resume was for this specific type of job. How well uh, does this fit? So just let us know that and we'll look it over. We love to do that. Another resume building tool that you can use is if anybody has heard of LaTeX and Marcus may have more familiarity, you can use that to build a resume or a CV. It takes a bit more programming experience something that I haven't used because I just tend to build my resume from uh, a Word document and then convert to PDF when I submit somewhere. But that's another tool that you may want to look into because I've heard it's a wonderful way to modify your resume over time without having to redo formatting. So that could be efficient in the long run, though there's a bit of an upfront investment in just learning how to do that. A good question that came out that I wanted to get to quickly so that you can use this information to leverage in the exercise that we're doing. <clears throat> How do you talk about courses that you've taken? And here we're talking about academic university courses, traditional semester long or quarter long courses. How can you talk about your undergrad or grad coursework? Is there a way to, to showcase that on a resume? There can be for sure. It may be something to keep in your comprehensive resume, again, so you just don't forget all the things that you've done. If you list course titles, and often I don't suggest that, but you may have to do that sometimes just in the interest of space or for the job, only list the course titles if they're really transparent. Course titles like Analyzing Linguistic Data with R, that's a course at Georgetown, that's pretty transparent. I get what you do in that course. If you have a course title like Discourse Analysis Seminar, as an employer, I don't know what that means. I have no idea. First of all, I likely don't know what discourse analysis is, and it may, be, may introduce a bit of a gap in understanding. So talking about a seminar as well seems pretty academic. What I'd suggest instead to showcase what you've done in a course is to actually list what you've done talk about the paper or the research that came out of that course. Talk about a project you accomplished in that course. For example, this is such a good example, Brielle's, Brielle Nikoloff, who's teaching our Conversation Design for Linguist course, has an undergraduate degree in linguistics and cognitive science. And for one of her courses, she wrote a paper on swear words and how Alexa responds to swear words, which gets at how Alexa is coded to respond to swear words and the gendered aspect of how a female voice is coded to respond to swear words. She wrote that paper in undergrad when she was talking to a potential employer about her experience in the voice space she hadn't had a job yet. This was for her first job. But she reached back and talked about that term paper on how Alexa responds to swear words and talked about what she learned from that, what she discovered, and what the implications are. And what that has showed that potential employer was, oh, this person has given thought to that issue. They may not have experience per se, they haven't worked in a voice first organization before. They haven't done the work of a voice user interface manager or coordinator, but they've thought about these issues. And that's what I need is somebody who has thought analytically about the issues and user experience of Alexa responding to swear words. That caught their attention, she got hired. So there are ways that you can bring up your academic research papers that will be very useful 
in job interviews and potentially on a resume. Um, keep it in mind for your comprehensive resume, for sure. And, you know, for a class, you may have also figured out a way to showcase your results, uh, maybe on a website that you built. I want to, you know, highlight Marcus here, who took the opportunity when he was in undergraduate school to build a website that um, showed the academic research that he pursued in a way that could reach a general public audience. Isn't that right, Marcus? Do you want to say quickly what you did? Because that was really great. Yeah, that was actually so long ago. Um, I think it was like my sophomore year of undergrad. I wrote a paper about um, African American English and uh, like ways to highlight African American English in the classroom and ended up making a website on Wix kind of pasting my research paper into the format of a Wix website and included some links to uh, YouTube videos that kind of talked about the same topic that my paper was about. So yeah, that's what it was about. And that shows so many things about Marcus. It shows that he can do content management. He can build a website. He can translate his research into something that can reach a broad audience. And that is incredibly useful to talk about in the form of a star story, which we'll go into in resume too. So even though that was a long time ago, that's a useful experience to recall and to also link to what you've done since then. I mean, since then, Marcus has built other websites. He is really getting into web design and, and conversation design, and this is all building his skill set. Okay, I'd like to turn now to our exercise, and I'll focus on answering some questions in the chat as we move forward. All the jobs I've ever had. We're gonna do this. I'd like you to get out of a sheet of paper <laughs> or open up a document on your, your laptop or your, your machine, open up a notes app on your phone, whatever you can do, make a column. It's gonna be a list of jobs. And when I say job, think experience. Think, think what we've talked about in terms of experience. That's gonna be your first column or the first list that you make. As we move forward in the exercise for each of the experiences, jobs that you list, I'd like you to think about the best thing and the worst thing about that job or experience. This is gonna do two things for you. It's gonna do so many things for you actually. The list of jobs is going to be what we move forward with in adding to your comprehensive resume so that you don't forget anything you've done so that you reframe things that you've done in the past as accomplishments that you can add to your comprehensive resume that later you can potentially put on a tailored resume. And adding in that best thing and worst thing, that's gonna tell you something about yourself in this process of self-discovery that's so necessary in finding a good fit between you and a job. So you started that process earlier in the week when you focused on your skills, interests, and abilities. This will tell you something about this, the skills and interests that you have and that form some patterns. You'll be able to see some underlying themes among those best things and work, worst things that will be unique to you. That's what we're gonna try and do. And just to highlight here again, this is adapted from an exercise that is in the book, Bringing Linguistics to Work by our dear friend, Anna Marie Trester. And I know that Marcus is gonna to link to that book in the chat. This is a book written by linguists for linguists about career management. And I use this in my career management class at Georgetown. You're gonna come up with a table, something like this. So, I mean, really, put down babysitting. If you worked as a babysitter and childcare, talk about the best thing. It might be making up activities for those kids. The worst thing might be the behavior management. That is, for many of us, um, like all those tears, all that resistance. A job, volunteering at an international education nonprofit. Best thing might be, you know, for me, it was the citizen diplomacy aspect and working with people from around the world and developing those relationships. 
Worst thing, well, there was low pay. We were really short staffed. Job, TA'd a graduate class. Best thing, creating my own lesson plan and lectures. Worst thing, grading. That wasn't, that was tough, right? That wasn't my favorite part. And I may be talking about myself. I may be just bringing out, up general experiences others may have. Built my own website, best thing. Figuring out WordPress, widgets, solving problems. Worst thing, oh, I didn't get paid for that. And yet it's something you could leverage. Now, when you complete this type of a table, what you'll start noticing are the themes that I mentioned. So among the best things, even in these, this limited list of four experiences, best thing seems to be making up stuff, creating lesson plans and lectures, figuring out things, the problem solving aspect. Some of this might lead to you looking for positions in curriculum design. All of that is part of being a curriculum designer or instructional designer. They're called different things in different organizations, but that is an area where we're subtly trained <laughs> or explicitly trained when we're in graduate school to learn how to do and that we have learned in other types of experiences how to do and we can keep developing those skills. Worst thing, low pay, not getting paid. Yeah, take notice of that. That may also guide you when you're trying to find your fit in the workplace. And we do have to think about, you know, paying our bills and how we can make a living where we want to live. That's going to play a role in our conversations to come. But for now, just get started with that list of jobs and experiences you've had. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to quietly brainstorm and write down those jobs. Start with the column of all the experience, please, so that you can just get it all out. Just keep writing, keep typing, don't stop. Try to think of things that you haven't put on your resume before that may be useful because again, this is going to be put into that comprehensive list of experiences. We're gonna debrief afterwards. And if you have questions as we go through, put them in the chat for our whole group debrief. And I'll also be working, looking at the chat and answering some questions. So I want to find out what, do, what reactions do you have to that brief exercise? And hopefully if you didn't get to figuring out the best and worst things in this 10 minutes, you'll continue that. This is just your first step, getting you started, getting you thinking about your experience in a new way. What are, what are some things you want to raise whole group about that 10 minutes? Yvette, is that a hand up? Yep. One thing. I found was kind of aside from the stuff that I could easily put down, like being a part, like being in, like the being achieving Eagle Scout and various involvement with extracurricular activities in my in college and high school, and as well as like going in with classes, which had some fun stuff. That was like first I found a good bit of ways to kind of apply activities that I generally wound up doing in leisure time, like game mastering for tabletop games or just designing characters. And kind of adding that to things. And then like kind of the kind of tendencies I found were like lots of creative things being the good parts. Like yeah, creative and camaraderie with motivated people while the bad parts tended towards like being restricted or being in groups that weren't motivated or people or where I couldn't interact with people effectively. That's great. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm, I'm glad you're noticing those patterns because that tells you so much about yourself and the types of positions that may be a good fit. This process of self-assessment is an ongoing process that I want you to continue. And I'm going to make available some tools. You got started on that with Daniel Moglin uh, doing the Imagine PhD self-assessment. It's, it's really necessary to keep going with this, to drill down on 
your skills, values, and interests, what you like, what you don't like, and make those explicit to yourself as a vet has just done, that is actionable knowledge. And that can help you out a lot later. So I'll make sure that, um, that I post those, those tools so you can keep going with this. And I'm glad also, um, Yvette, that you and I hope others are mining your, your leisure time activities for what you like to do. It's very important to keep in mind what we love and have that factor into our, our job search. I'm gonna also post a flower petal activity later that comes from the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Which is a, a long standing book that has been revised every year for the past 30 some years. And that petal exercise is a great uh, way to figure out what you like and how you prioritize things like what you enjoy in your leisure time and what you wanna get paid. And that'll be a good tool for you. Um, Jocelyn, I, uh, please correct my pronunciation and let me know what you'd like, like to tell us. Hello. Um, I just thought it, it was really cool. It validated my interests. You know, I'm very interested in sociolinguistics and I think all of the best things are things when I'm in touch with um, different dialects and different cultures in any job. So I thought that was really cool. Good, I'm glad. I, I love that some of you are feeling validation and feeling encouragement that things that you like to do and that you've already done are going to be what will help you get jobs in the future. Aubrey, I see your hand up. Hi, yes, so um, I found this pretty enlightening, I think. I, I knew these things about myself already, but um, it was nice to see it on paper. Um, so I found that uh, with a lot of my jobs, the thing that I usually liked about it was something that was very like structured and predictable. Um, and then the things that I didn't were the more uh, unpredictable, but also like spontaneous um, types of situations. So like I taught, uh, I was a camp counselor in France um, teaching English. And my favorite part of that was my lessons when I had planned it and I knew what was going to happen. I was in control. And then my um, least favorite part were all of the kind of open ended, like just playing and, you know, doing creative things with them because it just makes me a little bit um, not anxious, but, you know, apprehensive or something. So that's just, I think, something that might be the opposite for someone else, which is interesting. Um, yeah. And the other thing I, I was really thinking about that experience and what was my favorite part and I was thinking, oh, it's the lesson planning and the, and the um, lessons that I had with my students, but I was thinking more about it. And I don't think it was actually like the academic achievement that was rewarding to me, um, especially because they were younger. It was much more about like the kind of emotional progress that I saw. And I, when I saw them getting really excited about learning English and about, you know, traveling and, and, and seeing that impact was way more important to me as well. So I think that is also um, telling. That is so telling, Aubrey. I'm so glad you bring that up because knowing that, seeing that emotional impact that you have is important to you, tells you that you enjoy mentoring. There are so many opportunities to mentor outside of academic environments. This is what good managers do in organizations. Team, this is what good team leaders do in organizations. They do mentoring. Hopefully it's not micromanaging, but mentoring, guiding other people's progress in ways that are fulfilling to them and simultaneously fulfill the goals of the team and the organization. That's really useful to know. So many of the skills and things we like about academia that we find out just by drilling down to that, that knowledge, I like mentoring. I like seeing that emotional progress and that excitement, you know, the, the lighting up and the, the progress that people make. Know that you can apply that outside of academic contexts, in business, in nonprofits, many different areas. Thank you. Marina. Yeah, hi everyone. I was just gonna say that like, uh, I did this kind of exercise before, but I was more focusing on Firstly, like my industry experience and secondly, teaching or research experience. But I never, I, I never was thinking about like some 
certain stuff I did uh, just uh, for fun or as a, a volunteer. And uh, in the process of this exercise, I noticed that, like, for example, there are like two uh, things they're mentoring and uh, volunteering on different events. And for events, I like, I understood that, like, I did. I participated in certain things in high school, then like during my first, second year of undergrad. And now as a grad student, I see the certain um, changes in the roles that I do. So like from like reg registration or like something like that, like being a high school student on like international exhibition, uh, then uh, helping uh, with the, uh, Translation, for example, during the undergrad, and now I am like in the programming committee of the conferences. And I'm like, wow, this is like another thing I could highlight as a, an extracurricular thing. And like, I never thought about it. And like about mentoring also, it's like one person and like several people. And then the person was just like, how to enter the university. But now it's more about like being an international student, uh, about like career, so it's 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 really interesting to see these changes. I love it. Thank you, Marina, and thank you for highlighting the changes that you see over time and the development you see over time, because that can form the basis of a narrative you tell about yourself in how you take on leadership roles, and what you enjoy about leadership roles and what you've accomplished through leadership that can be the basis of what we call a, a star narrative, which we'll delve into in resumes too. I know we're a bit past our scheduled <clears throat> stop time. <clears throat> Pardon me. Those of you who need to leave, please feel free. Just know that we will continue this discussion as I highlighted in the, our agenda, we will start talking about how to form those bullet points for those different experiences, what format they can take to be most effective and most impactful. Um, thanks for letting me use that industry term. And we will also talk about how to create that tailored job application package in resumes too. So one of you asked about cover letters, we'll talk about tailoring resumes, tailoring cover letters, if they're even asked for in resumes too next week. So for those of you who need to go and take a much needed break, I hope you'll continue this exercise, keep brainstorming, mining your past experiences for those non-paid volunteer jobs, those times that you worked as a leader in a student organization, those, those times that you worked for yourself to accomplish a project for yourself. And think about putting that on your comprehensive resume. And then keep that process of self-discovery going by finding out what was the best part, the worst part, and looking for those trends. So you're accomplishing a lot with this exercise you can take going forward. Thanks, everyone.